How's it going, Jolkson? I'm doing well. So much more time in my schedule now, so I can kind of just relax a bit. Let's get to the end of the semester. Doing a little bit more streaming as a result. It's okay. Oh, and I saw there was a thing in the news. It was like, a, it was further away from where I thought it was, but it was a recycling scrap yard caught on fire. Oh. <laughs> it was a lot of, it was a lot of smoke coming. Yeah, there was just a lot of smoke coming up, so I don't know what it was. Some sort of flatworm. Two of them. Daddy is cute, and Daddy is strong, Daddy is brave, and Daddy will not step. Cyanide, I want to show you something. Hang on. What do you think about that? There's a cyanide command now. Shout yourself out whenever you'd like. How's things going? Charland, 2019. How you doing? Finally got to catch a stream. Well, it helps when I start at like nine o'clock at night, you know? Then you're, uh, you're up by that point usually. There's a little diet tongue. Let's zoom in and take a look at it. Oh, there's a worm coming, sneaking up on us over here somewhere. It's Gyro Sigma. I like to say it's sort of shaped like a Dairy Queen symbol. I guess only people in the U.S. would know what a Dairy Queen is, though. Sorry, people from outside the U.S. It reminds me of Dairy Queen, which is an ice cream place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wild Bloob. How are you doing? Welcome in. We're, uh... We're looking at a sample from a pond. Again, a uh, different pond though, from last night. Uh, the pond I was looking at from last night is Hawthorne and uh, a close by park. And the uh, sample I'm looking at from today is from uh, 
Deming Park, which is also a close by park. And, uh, diatoms, ciliates, some flatworms. So far, what I've seen these little ciliates. And, uh, that's sort of the usual suspects. There's a big ciliate over here. Chase around a little. They're uh, pretty mobile. You wonder what the canal near you looks like? Um, well, there's only one way to find out cyanide. You gotta, you gotta take a look at it. You know, get yourself some microscopes to look through. That's pretty much it. That's how you do it. Uh, you need to buy a thousand dollar microscope? No. Um, you can get by with a cheaper microscope. I think Dell's microscope only cost him about um, $150 or something. And he streams from it without any problem. I don't have a lot of patience for people who you know. feel like they're downloading from the cosmos. Oh, look at this little guy. He's got a... You know, just like, that's how it came out. He's got a, a, a flagella right there. He's using it to pull around in front of himself. See his little flagella? It's like a snake with a really long tongue that's waggling in front of itself. Snake, obviously. Hey, Micah, how's it going? You tell your mom that Dr. Mo made you. I um, I never make anybody do anything, except for my daughter. This one's like a eat your paisley right there. That's a uh, a ciliate. You can. Maybe just barely see around the outside edge, there's sort of like a distortion. Oh, don't reverse directions. You're making it hard for me to figure out which way to go. See right around the outside edge, with some distortion. If it would sit still, I could zoom in on it and you'd see it a little more clearly. But those are the cilia that they use to crawl around with. So you can kind of fit through all these little tiny spots in here. They're more ribbon shaped than you think. They look like, you know, they look like they've got a big body, but most of their bodies are ribbon shaped, like skinny little things. Am I playing music? Yeah, that's, uh, that's music coming into my stream. Hey, Robert. How's it going? Um, in the evenings, when I do stuff from my microscope, I play a little, you know, pretzel rock into my stream. That there is an ostracod shell. Probably from a molt. Um, the ostracod is no longer in it, obviously. But it looks like a jelly bean, right? That's their, their normal shape. <laughs> you like the music? Well, you know, a lot of times I was resistant to the idea of playing music because uh, I feel like it's not really cool for me to pick what you should listen to and you could just listen to your own music, right? But uh, I suppose a lot of people don't have music playing. Um... And so for them, it probably is nice. Hey, it's a little piece of plastic in my sample. Um, I collected this sample using a jar, so I did not insert any plastic into it. So any plastic we find is something people have put in the lake. 
that I collected it from. Uh, here's one that's sitting still. And we can get in on it. I know sometimes specific plankton uses a plankton net, and sometimes I use a plankton net. Um, but uh, not this time. There you go. Get in nice and close on it. You can see all the cilia. Some sort of Eplodes, Paramecium kind of a thing. You can see the cilia on this really clearly though. I get in close. They're very twitchy. Another little guy coming in to visit that's also a ciliate. There's a lot of different types of ciliates. <laughs> you would like to consume a diatom. Some of these guys probably would. Here comes another little guy into the field of view, but if I gotta back off a little, there he is. Now there's two of them. Let's go look. Let's go look around a bit more. Uh, that's a Spirogyra, and this is a really good view of that's a healthy diatom right there I don't know why it's parked in the sediment um, it looks like a nominees costata probably an nominees at the very least uh, based on the shape the kind of football shaped and um, I think I see some extra stri around the center which is characteristic of a nominees and then this is an empty diatom cell right here. Uh, a different species, that's Criticula. Um, I don't know, maybe Criticula halophila. <laughs> you don't know why, but you feel like they'd be the perfect type of crunch if they weren't microscopic and all. You might still be able to crunch them. They probably do have a good crunch because their skeletons are, you know, silica. Uh, this little guy is a rotifer swimming in to see us. It is a planktonic rotifer, and that usually means predator. So it's out looking for food. Hey, Timo, how's it going? Recognize you from Dell's streams. Ah, don't go the other way. We're following a rotifer around. This one is politely slow, and it's allowing me to keep up with it perfectly. And it's also not changing the height uh, as it goes. There's some diatoms on the bottom of the screen there. That's a little tiny diatom, and up at the top, right there is an Acnanthes, Acnanthidia minutissima, probably. We'll let it lead us to the next thing we want to look at, some more diatoms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good news, everyone! <laughs> You don't, uh, you don't need any knowledge. You can just think it's cool stuff moving around on the screen and or just hang out. It's all right. You could learn it. Uh, this thing here is called a rotifer. They got their name because they have a bunch of cilia around the front end of their mouth and they look like they're spinning even when they aren't. Um, these ones, unfortunately, their cilia are very small and so in order to see them, we would have to be super close like super close you can just barely see right at the right at the front of its mouth there's some uh some movement a little bit of distortion basically on the back end they always have uh toes a foot with toes and this one has two little toes that you can see clearly maybe it has three but i think there's just two and um 
it uses that to hang on to stuff. So when you see it do pivot, its tail is like grabbing stuff that's actually not its tail, it's its foot. Mouth cilia sounds creepy. Now you got the picture of the underside of it for a second there. It flipped itself over. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell which way is up for these things because uh, they're transparent, well, translucent. So. Animals are always interesting no matter how small. Yeah, it's just looking for food. Uh, that's what it's doing. And it's coasting around. It's probably eating a little bit of bacteria and stuff. Um, as it goes, we might not even notice those particles disappearing. It kind of looks like a chubby tadpole. I mean, tadpoles are sort of soft. Uh, rotifers, I think, have kind of like a... Sort of have a carapace. But... Um, I was giving a lecture today in my hydrology class and we were talking about tadpoles that live in river systems. And there's a Asian tadpole that has, um, you know how tadpoles usually have their mouth in sort of the front of their body, like frogs do? Um, Asian tadpoles have their, the, the ones that live in river systems, they have their mouths down like this and um, they've got suckers on them. and. Um, the suckers are so strong that you could pick them up by their tail if they're attached to a rock that's five times their weight, and you could still get them to pick it up. It's kind of cool. But, uh, I haven't seen any of those tadpoles in the U.S. Um, we do have tadpoles that live in streams, though. Yeah, it kind of reminds you of horseshoe crabs. You want to be as strong as the tadpoles one day? Well, it's all mouth muscle, so um, I bet if we picked you up by your feet and you, you, you were biting down on a rope or something, um, you might be able to pick up a rock that was five times your weight. <laughs> You're a tadpole that hangs out in Twitch streams. Huh? I kind of wish this rotifer would find us something cooler to chase around for a bit. It's, we've been following it. I was thinking it was going to lead us to something cool, but so far it's just led us to some trash. So... Yeah, I hooked the little guy up with a snack. There's a diatom right there. That is Gyrus Sigma. It's dead. Um, and there's probably some bacteria growing on it, but the rotifer did not seem to care about that. He's just chugging along. He's probably just eating bacteria in the water as he goes. Oh, there's another little ciliate he's following. Sometimes, because they're transparent, you can see what they've been eating. Um, you know, if they eat a diatom or something, you can sometimes see the diatom inside their belly. And, oh, there's another. Oh, it's the same one, I think. It's Gyro Sigma. Um, last night we were watching Pacific Plankton stream, and um, there was a little feronid worm that ate a, um, a dinoflagellate, and the dinoflagellate looks like a little rocket ship, um, but it's got like a spine coming off the front end and a couple of spines coming off the back end that make it extra long, and it kind of got stuck in the worm's throat, uh, and it was, you know, sitting in there for a long time like it wouldn't go down the throat, but it was trapped inside of its body, so... Um, Lepidoterons, uh, how does it decide where to go? Does it smell? Um, I think probably they have chemical uh, sensors in their bodies of some type um, that allow them to detect food particles or things that they assume are food. Um, a lot of rotifers just eat detritus. And so among other things, probably they just get the bacteria from the detritus. Um, and so, uh, you know, they might, they might be able to detect the, the bacteria, but I don't know how it figures out where to go. I mean, like, it's just a, doing its own thing. It makes decisions. It sort of responds to its environment. I don't, I don't think that this type of rotifer has eyes, um, although they might have, like, rudimentary eyes that are, like, you know, just light sensors, basically. And so um, it might be following us around. As I move the light, it might be trying to, like, stay in the light. Um, 
Some of them are, as I mentioned, sort of visual predators. I've definitely seen some rotifers that have eye spots, um, but I don't know about these guys. It's, um, there's a little bit of dis color distortion from um, the, I have the DIC on really strong, which is a type of light. Um, uh, to add extra contrast, it's differential interference contrast. And um, so it's, it's making it look redder than it is. But uh, hey, it did lead us to something else. found a ciliate to follow. You see how they differ in the way that they move? I think we're a little, it's going to be a little challenging to get this thing completely in focus because it's so twitchy. Here we go. <laughs> That's an extra difficulty level, trying to keep it inside. Uh, but you can actually see the particles moving around its mouth, in this case, for the ciliate. It could if I could keep it in its field of view. Um, the, the particles, as it moves, basically move around and into its mouth. And um, you can kind of see it feeding on some of them. See the particles kind of moving as it moves through them? Um, we are looking at a sample that's between slides uh, right now, and this particular guy is really skinny, um, and so are those left, they're little ciliates. So it's probably just um, a couple of microns thick, um, very, very skinny. But there are some larger organisms in here. Um, last night we were, I'm just going to troll around a little, there's some more, they're out on the edge. Um, there's some water out here on the edge past the cover slip, so that boundary, oops, wait, let's see. That boundary right there is the cover slip glass. And um, so some of the organisms can actually pass through that pretty easily. And um, Um, we're on, so another thing I should tell you is um, we're on 10x magnification, but we're actually closer to like 80 times magnification, but I can jump up to the, um, the 200x objective. And now everything's a little bit bigger. Uh, there. Uh, and the resolution's actually a bit better at this um, level, but the depth of field is shallower. So like I can't get the whole organism, in this case the ciliate, to be in focus at the same time. Um, because as we get closer, the depth of field shrinks as well. So just like anything else uh, in a camera or um, I mean, you know, in any sort of equipment, um, the closer you get to it, the less of it you can get in focus at the same time. Paul, relative to the width. Oh, they're not cylindrical shaped. They're maybe um, uh, like relative to the actual width of the organism, they're probably about a third of the, um, the width in thickness. Um, and parts of the body are a little bit thicker, like the head's usually a little wider, um, where you can see the cilia wrapped around its um, front part. That part's usually a little bit wider, uh, and then the back is usually a little bit more ribbony. Um, but it depends on the ciliate. You can really see the cilia spinning in this case. What are you looking for? Um, it's not in here. All right, let's go look around. Good news, everyone! Oh, thank you for the follow. I got my uh, chat window right in front of that. Chiropted. That's an interesting name. That's a diatom. I'm going to zoom out so we can zoom around a little bit and see what we can find. 
Diatom. More diatoms. There's another diatom. Again, that's a... I think an Anomanese. Yeah, it's an Anomanese. Almost certainly. Although I suppose it could be a star anise. Can't see the middle very clearly. I think it's a nominese. And you can see it's got its little cilia out. It's like feeling around for food particles. Crazy looking organism. Uh, that's a flagella, actually, yeah, not a cilia. I think it's using it to crawl a little bit too. I think it's using it to move. Like it's putting its little flagella down on the ground, or maybe it's just spinning it like a helicopter to pull itself. Kind of looks like it's spinning the end of it like a little helicopter. Oh, there's another one even smaller. Passed right underneath it. There's a bunch of these little guys. It's probably um, heterotrophic nanoflagellates or cryptomonids, something like that. See what else we can get to. Those things are moving just a little bit, but I think it's probably just the water moving. <laughs> it seems inefficient. It probably is pretty inefficient, but when you're little, uh, just pulling yourself along like a little helicopter works okay, I guess. I mean, it was moving. That is a stack of diatoms right there. Another diatom. Some more diatoms. It's Gyrosigma. There's another Anomanese. Something in the pile. Oh, uh, yeah. A little paisley creeping up on that diatom. Uh, thank you, Cindy. I specialize on hypnosis. When you leave my stream, you're going to feel especially good. Not that it's over, I mean, if you stay and watch. I'm going to hypnotize you into having a good time. I'm going to use my hypnotic voice to also lull you in. At the sound of the chime, block like a chicken. I'm gonna zoom back out so I can kind of try to find ourselves something interesting to look at. What's the brown goo that's not moving? Uh, there's a little bit of sediment, detritus, basically. Um, that uh, was in the sample, so let's see. You can kind of see that jar of material there. It's kind of a mix of sediment and vegetation. I got my sandals wet um, to get the sample for you guys. I walked out into the murk a little bit and uh, you know how my sandals probably smell a bit like the lake but uh, it's not the first time I've put my sandals in the lake so they're waterproof they'll get over it give me an excuse to clean them actually 
we saw these two giant flatworms earlier that were kind of crawling around in here. I have lost track of them, which means they're here somewhere. They just Climbing around. It's a cool little diatom. Uh, I might take a bit of this material and make some prepared slides from it. Oh, there's one. I think it's a flatworm. like gummy worms. Uh, I don't think these ones taste very good. These are like those uh, jelly beans you eat. This is like the poop flavored gummy, gummy worms. Probably not very good. But I bet if you ate a bunch of them, one of them tastes like chocolate and the other one tastes like poop. So... If you're not following cyanide teacups, what are those jelly beans called that you eat? Just torture yourself with? I always forget the name. <laughs> I do have a mesmerizing voice. <laughs> uh, I'm very good at flat delivery. That's my, that's my delivery. Uh, that way, if it's not funny, nobody can tell I was trying to make a joke. I <laughs> hit the buy more. If you're not following Cyanide Teacups, you should. She's a streamer, and really one of my favorite people on Twitch. And she's been following me forever. And she spends her money here, uh, buying subscriptions to the channel and stuff. Um, I should point out that uh, I don't take any of the money home from the channel. Uh, or rather, I pay taxes Good news, on it. Everyone. And then after I'm done paying taxes on it, I, I use it to buy supplies and uh, donate for research for students in my lab. So, um, if you use Cheers or follow um, using the subscription tool, um, you're just supporting undergraduate research. So... Um, and my students mostly look at diatoms, not all these other things that we're looking at. But I think I do have one student who's super interested in it. <laughs> oh, cyanide. I was not asking for you to cheer, you know that. Um, I think this is a little... Uh, it seems completely uninteresting, but I think it's actually a, uh, a test date amoeba home. I think that's a test date amoeba a test. Um, the amoeba's not in it currently, clearly, or it's hiding in there, but I think that's what that is, based on the shape. Sometimes the amoeba come out. <laughs> you parked it? Um, yeah, I don't know where the amoeba is. Last night, uh, I was streaming as well, and we had a, uh, a test date amoeba on for a really long time. I was just, I just left the camera pointed on it and was kind of chatting with people. Some more plastic. And, um... They're kind of fun just to sit and watch, you know, because they move so slowly. Talk about hypnotic. Those guys, they'll really hypnotize you. All right, uh, I made this sample a little while ago. That is Sparagyra. Um, and uh, I just threw some stuff from that little jar that I collected on here. That's another ostracot valve. 
Um, that's a diatom moving around in there. Um, oh, here's a diatom that's moving around. Let's zoom in and take a look at this guy. Let's put it on the big. There we go. I gotta come back out so you can see stuff, but. It was just like, uh, it was a test date amoeba, and then it was just putting its little pseudopods out, feeling around, and then like crawling in random directions. Super cool. Pretty laid back. Um, I got like a crazy number of raids last night um, from really big streamers, well, medium sized streamers. And uh, so it was like, Vizaria and paleontologizing and Mr. Horologist, like they all rated me one after another. And so I had like a whole bunch of people in here, you know, plus and minus to that. Um, what's my favorite microscope word? Diatoms? Um, I'll have to think about that. Uh, my favorite microscope word. I suppose there's probably a lot of cool words. <laughs> um, I don't know. It sort of cycles. You know, I sometimes have streams and there's just like five people in here, which is fine with me. I have a nice quiet night. And then sometimes it's just crazy and there's tons of raids and there's lots of people and there's lots of excitement, um, which is also fun. So. Zoomies. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, what's moving around over here? I'm following the silly little diatom around. Now that's my pace. I can keep that thing in the field of view easily. I think that's bacteria right there that's crawling around at it. So people ask me about bacteria. I think that little guy is bacteria. Oh, slowly, the diatom is crawling. Uh, how do diatoms move? I don't know. That's like a mystery of the universe right there. Um, kind of like a, like a tank moves or a snail that kind of like drag themselves along by protoplasm, cytoplasm. Um, they have a, uh, a fissure that runs through the middle of the valve called a raphe, and you can see it um, because it goes through both sides of the diatom. Hang on. It's this thing right here, this sort of thing that splits the diatom down the middle moving faster than I can keep up with it. Uh, right here, the solid line that kind of runs down the axis in this diatom is the raphe, and it's like a fissure or a slot. Um, and it sort of drags itself or pulls itself along, I don't know, kind of hydraulically through pushing and pulling stuff out that slot. So, um, we might be able to see a little bit better in one of these where it's not moving around. That's a Kalanis. Oh, you can see there's something in the background, a little bit of bacteria wiggling around. Uh, a couple of different types of bacteria wiggling around. There's like a snaky one crawling around. Uh, don't ask me how those things move. I suppose they might have some sort of flagella. Rafi not to be confused with the Rafi nuclei. Alright, let's 
zoom back out. Let's go for a spin. Oh. Let's see what else we can find in here, and then I might switch a sample out for us to try to find something else. Um, I've been looking for uh, a stentor, uh, which is a type of ciliate that I've never seen in the light microscope, other than I've seen them on like Dell's stream before. Oh, that's a rotifer, a big fat one. Uh, uh, see on the back side. Oh, he's he's spinning. This is gonna be nice. There, you can see he's got a foot back here with four toes that he's using to hold on to the cover slip. And a she, not he. And then it's got a bunch of goop around it that it's hiding in. Uh, but there, it's pulled out its corona. And it's got a little antenna. Hey, Smooch. Thank you for the cheer. <gasps> he pulled it back in. Or she did, rather. Uh, sorry. It decided to just totally move, which they do occasionally. There. Um, so on the back end is just one foot with all those little toes right there that it's using to hold on. And the front end is like two little propellers, like jet engines, basically. And it's uh, kind of spinning them, although it's really kind of just whirling them around in position like this. Good news, everyone! And they look like they're twirling like, um, like a propeller, but they're actually just wiggling in place. And in rotifers, which is what this is, um, those things on the front end, it's got like two sets of them. And then it's got its mouth in there in between it, which is just a little hole. And this, uh, this structure right here is actually the antenna, which is, it's sticking up in another direction. That's not where its mouth is. Its mouth is actually right here. And you just saw a particle go into its mouth. And then this is its jaw called a mastac. The mastax is just like a movable jaw inside of its um, throat, basically. So it's got like internal teeth and it uses that to crunch up particles. And then this is its stomach down here. Um, and so you get a really clear look at it right here. Have I tried to invert and reverse the image of your screen to help with tracking? Um, you know, I could do that. Uh, you're right in um, like inside uh, OBS. Um, that is definitely something you can do. Uh, I just uh, try to train myself to figure it out because on there I also have to train myself to work backwards. So it's less challenging than you think. Um, in fact, uh, on here, it's actually closer to the normal dimensions, like down is down and up is up and uh, left is left and right is right. But uh, in the microscope, everything is backward. So I'm actually more capable if I just looked at the arrows on the screen to figure out like which way I need to move. Um, I'm just used to thinking about looking at it in here where everything is inverted. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of just training myself to figure it out. Uh, Gumpy2, this is a rotifer. Uh, this is a rotifer belonging to the, the deloid rotifers, uh, which means it's a female because deloid rotifers have no male. Um, they only, they're unisexual uh, species. Uh, actually, the whole class of rotifers are unisexual. They are obligate uh, parthenogenic organisms, which means that the females lay eggs, which are basically clones of themselves, um, which then grow up to be just like them. Um, and they don't need to have any fertilization to do that. And what's interesting about um, deloid rotifers is they've been doing it this way for at least 10 million years. And I think the best estimates are it's actually closer to 65 million years without ever having sex. And why that's important, um, one, that the species is, there's a lot of unisexual species, actually, people don't recognize this, but like, um, 
there's you know salamanders that are the same way but the oldest salamanders that are like that have only been doing it for about four or five million years whereas the deloid rotifers have been at it for a really long time and most organisms that switch to this sort of lifestyle where they only um, they only have females in their population they usually uh, knock themselves out of existence because that sort of lifestyle parthenogenesis is dangerous um, there's no way to adapt to your environment if it changes and so um, because they don't do DNA recombination um, and the reason that the deloid rotifers are actually have been so successful at it is um, this is the type of rotifer that can actually completely dry out and uh, come back to life if you wet the, the, the slide. And they're capable of withstanding really high levels of UV radiation. And they're basically just like, you know, uh, how uh, water bears are these like rugged species that people talk about. Rotifers are the same way. And in some ways, they're even more capable of withstanding some things that, um, that water bears cannot. Um, but they go into the same sort of a state, in a dehydrated state. They can handle all kinds of crazy conditions and then just come right back to life and start reproducing. So, um, been lurking for a while, enjoying the stream? Good. Uh, I'm glad. So, the, um... <laughs> I have a very cool place. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of books in the background. That's my, this is my office area. Um... Uh, they're not all identical. They they have um, different genetic founding materials for each line, but they never recombine. Um, what they do if they are exposed to really high levels of radiation or if they dry out, the thing that separates the rotifers from these rotifers from every other type of organism that's managed to, to become unisexual is that they can repair damage super well. And um, scientists think that the, um, the ability to repair damage like that is the same way that like water bears can take damage and they just repair it. So, um, you know, it's not that they're super rugged. They're more, um, they're more like Swamp Thing or Wolverine than Superman. They're not invulnerable to damage. They take the damage and then they just sort of heal from the damage a lot quicker than other types of organisms. And so... Um, in their case, the reason that they can withstand all these crazy things, and also is true for water bears and many other organisms that, can, that are extremophiles, is that they can repair the damage very, very fast. And, um, and so they can basically come back from what would normally kill other types of organisms. And, um, and it's usually associated with organisms that can dehy be dehydrated. So water bears... Um, uh, the um, nematode worms and the rotifers all have the same sort of fundamental response is that they can kind of repair from damage easily and that's usually associated with these sort of like extremophile type organisms um, that are linked with those kinds of uh, issues hey devil and mrs j how are you doing um, look, I made a, um, you know this already, but I've got a, um, I've got a command for Devil and Mrs. J, too. Um, I'm trying to do them for all the streamers who come in my channel regularly, you know, that hang out here. Um, I'm working my way down the list, so I still have some to go. But, um, we're looking at this rotifer, which has conveniently oriented itself in the length of my field of view. <laughs> Um, and there's its foot working. You can see it basically moves its body, inches up, attaches its foot, pushes with that, and then contracts it, and, um, and then moves its foot to the place where it contracted to. So, and then now it's just moved to a new location. One of the things that's cool is um, you can see all the particles as it spins the, the, uh, the cilia, the corona around the mouth here all the particles that are sort of swirling and being pulled in and from how far away they're actually being pulled in so um 
the range on this thing's uh, jet engine, basically, you can see particles all the way up here that are being vacuumed in and they're being a current's being created by those little hairs moving. And then you can see them basically cycling back out. So there's a gyre on this side and there's a gyre on the other side going in the opposite direction. Um, but you can see the particles all the way out here that are being pulled in towards it, you know, more than the length of its body away um, as a result of the current that it's creating. And then it's, it's basically just moving up. There's its antenna. It's got its little antenna out. It was looking. Uh, that's how it sort of detects things. What is it, Wednesday? You want to see all the stuff on the microscope? Every time. Oh my goodness, every time there's a stream going on, you want to get involved and see what's on the microscope? It looks exciting. You wanna look in there? Anything good? No, you're not into rotifers. You guys got a free Wednesday on the microscope. I didn't have to, you didn't have to use any of your channel points. She just came and put herself on the microscope. Didn't you? Yeah. You were hoping I'd get a treat out of it. No treats, you're not interested. Well, you distracted me and the rotifer got away. So you can see it's got like a little uh, feeler, an antenna that it sticks out. It's kind of testing in front of itself. And then its jaws are currently, the little corona are folded inside of its body right now. And if you watch, you'll see when it finds some place that it thinks there might be food um, and it's attached itself, it's, it's sort of like feeling around. It's kind of sensing in front of itself a little bit. Now these rotifers actually probably do have eyes, um, little light sensing eyes. Um, I, I might be able to get them to show up if I switch out of the super high contrast that we're looking at um, a little bit. Let me do, let me do that and see if I can get his eyes to show up. So it's a little more translucent here. Um, and you can see there's a red spot. Uh, it's hard for me to keep up with. There are some sort of solid red spots on, on it uh, right there. Those are eyes. Those little pieces right there I think are the eyes. I'm just gonna put the heavy DIC back on. Come off of it just a little. Uh, <laughs> am I streaming what I'm watching on my microscope? Of course. Good news, everyone. Um, I don't know how to, um, what do you, I already let you up here Wednesday. Um, I don't know how to prove it to you. I guess I, I'll move up right now and then I'll move to the right and I'll move to the left. So, um, <laughs> I would have had to time that pretty good if this was a video. <laughs> also, uh, the blinking light that you see is, um, I'm, I'm sitting on the microscope, so that should be a clue, but that's my camera, so the camera's blinking, and I guess if you want, I can, if you're not sure if I'm making adjustments to it, you can see me making adjustments to it, right? Like, so, yeah, this is um, streaming from the microscope. We're not watching a video. Uh, I mean, you're watching a video. <laughs> I guess I am in a way. Um... Uh, what kind of books do I like to read? Well, um, most of the time when I'm reading, I want to sort of escape. So um, there's sort of two kinds of books on my bookshelf back there. They are either like um, nerdy science books about uh, evolution and um, like uh, uh, long-term transitions in the fossil record. I'm going to follow this... Uh, this guy for a while right here, the ciliate. 
Um, or, uh, oh, there's another ciliate. Got a whole collection of them all right here. And there's something else down here. Another ciliate. Um, or it's like science fiction fantasy, um, which is like a good way for me to sort of escape from uh, my work. So, because I'm a professor in my um, as a job, and so I sometimes just need a break from reality, and those are nice um, books for me to read. So, if you're um, I also have some sort of classic literature, magical realism kind of books that I like. So I really like um, Kafka and Gabriel Garcia Marquez and um, Fyodor Dostoevsky. And um, so there's some classics that I'm really, I really like. But um, but a lot of my science fiction reading is and fantasy reading is just sort of whatever um, the good stuff, basically, you know. I like uh, China Maville and um, uh, Scott Lynch and Robert Jordan, uh, uh, Brandon Sanderson, those kinds of people. Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind is a really good book. Okay, I'll take a look. Hi, Two Chooks! How are you doing? Um, I do like this sort of science communication style uh, evolutionary books. Um, I really like the Darwin's Dangerous Idea by Daniel Dennett. And um, I read a lot of Dawkins books, the Selfish Gene series and all those. Uh, what am I zoomed in on right now? Uh, in the center right now, up against the water bubble, the air bubble that's right here, that's the air bubble. Um, this is a rotifer. It's a deloid rotifer. Um, you can tell that from the shape. They have these sort of long cylindrical type bodies and they attach um, with a foot. This one has four toes. There's these little feet that basically attach. It's got two main toes and then two sort of supporting toes. And um, that's it's eating right now. So it's um, spinning the corona. That's its antenna and that's its mastax, which is like internal feeding thing, which it can pull itself inside of its body basically, and then pull out its uh, little spinny things. And then these are ciliates. So they get that name from the little hairs around their body. Um, and there's another ciliate down here, spinning around. That's a ciliate. And then these things in the really far in the background are um, bacteria, I think or they might be heterotrophic nanoflagellates. You love Richard Dawkins, yeah. <laughs> Some lovely alliteration. <laughs> I don't even know what I said, uh, which is pretty normal for me. I don't pay attention to what I'm saying most of the time. Uh, but we have this giant air bubble and I'm gonna try to... Um, I saw something else in here that was really cool earlier. That is a uh, spirogyra, by the way. Um, I saw something in here that was really cool earlier, and I thought, oh, I've got to come back and take a look at it. Oh. 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 Is Cyanide still here? Are you still hanging out, Cyanide? Um, that's a, uh, testate amoeba. Right there. Hang on. I'm gonna fix it. Good news, everyone! It's about to get really cool. Alright, so that brown circle in the middle of the screen, you can see coming out of it, uh, right here, these little things look like tentacles. They're coming out from all different sides. Those are the pseudopods on an amoeba. And you can see that it will sort of spin them out and then it'll split. And sometimes they'll reach really long distances and then it uses those to sort of drag itself along. Yeah, uh, um, Koa a thousand, the battery flashes like that for kind of a long time, and then, uh, I've got another battery over there that's charging, and another battery and a camera that's the same camera body over there, 
and it's fully charged. So uh, it'll be okay. When it runs out of batteries, I'll just switch it. So I'm just trying to run it all the way down before I put it back on the charger. That's, uh, that's just how I do things around here. So it, it's annoying, it's sitting up there flashing and it's like, you know, it makes it seem like there's something dangerous gonna happen soon, but it'll be fine. It's, it adds a sense of urgency to my stream, a false sense of urgency. Uh, oh, my favorite book by Dawkins, yeah. Oh, I think you mean Daniel Dennett's uh, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. It's a really good book. So those things that just stretch out are the pseudopods, and um, the amoeba is living inside of that brown thing. It has an, uh, sort of a um, circular opening at the bottom. In fact, if you look really carefully, you can see it right there. It's like a donut ring, right? There's like a bright orange area, and then there's a center part that's a little bit dimmer. And that's the opening where the amoeba, uh, I don't know what's happening right now, actually. <laughs> I'm kind of confused what it just did. Oh, either it's, uh, it's either pooping something out that it was eating, which just looks like what it did, I think it just pooped out that stuff. I think it just squeezed it out of its shell. Yeah. And now it's looking for more food. Uh, can you ask what I do for a living? Yeah. Um, hey, District 10, how are you doing? District 10, check this out. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Boom. Uh, you got your own shout out now, built into my robot. I'm working on it for all of my streamer friends. Um, yeah, this one's really cool. Look at it, it's just like, oh, there goes the battery. It was gonna happen eventually. Now I don't have a battery. Maybe we'll just put this one in and there'll still be a sense of urgency because the battery will be low. Forty-five percent, we'll be okay. important when I stream tomorrow. Okay, let's get this thing back in our field of view because it's crazy looking cool. Boom, there we go. Look at all those crazy pseudopods coming out. Good now. news, everyone! Isn't that neat? Thank you for the follow, uh, Ryskill. Um, sorry, uh, for Koa, you asked what I do. I'm a paleolimnologist, paleoecologist, and I actually study diatoms, which we've seen some diatoms on the stream. Um, but because I study lakes and lake organisms, um, I actually know a lot about most of these organisms. And, uh, and some of them uh, I just have taught myself about because I see them on the microscope quite a bit. And in the evenings I stream from my light microscope during the day uh, I stream from a scanning electron microscope sometimes and I'll be streaming from the scanning electron microscope tomorrow from 1 to 3 Eastern time because I'm in the US and uh, we'll probably just look at diatoms tomorrow but maybe some other things that are in the diatom samples
Oh, you're making jokes. Um, is it possible to see the nucleus of the amoeba? Maybe it's seen and you're not realizing. Uh, Jimmy James, the uh, the entire middle part of the amoeba is inside the um, this testate structure. So it's like a little home it carries around with it. And you won't see the middle part of the amoeba. You'll only ever see the pseudopod sticking out the holes. Um, earlier, this thing spit a bunch of junk out that it was eating. And then suddenly more pseudopods came out. So it had like a whole belly full of stuff in there. And then it, uh, it spit all of it out. And then suddenly we got all of these pseudopods uh, branching out in every direction now. When before we just had a couple of little stream, streamy strands that were pulling it along. And I think it's hunting for more food right now. So for these types of amoeba, I don't think you'll ever see the nucleus part. You won't see the middle part. This is super interesting. Uh, that sounds like a really cool job. I love my job, uh, Koa. I um, am privileged to be a professor and to teach people and to be able to do research that I enjoy. And I'm particularly um, always happy to be able to share it with people on Twitch and um, with students. There's a little, there's a little uh, Euploides that snuck into our field of view for a second there. That was another ciliate. Um, the amoeba fit into a group called the Sarcodines and uh, Rotifers, which we've seen. The ciliates, the Sarcodines and um, the Cladocera are basically the major groups um, that, of organisms that we would normally see in, um, in lake materials. And then um, for the metazoas, um, like the ciliates, for example, or the, uh, the amoebas, um, uh, there's a pretty wide range of stuff. In my samples, I don't usually see copepods. I haven't found any systems that have copepods in them around here. Um, but we've seen Cladocera quite a bit, a whole bunch of different types of Cladocera. And then we usually see a bunch of worms here as well. So earlier we had some flatworms, um, and I see sometimes see nematode worms um, in samples. And then uh, sometimes I look for water bears and things like that. Today, I'm just looking at whatever's in here. Um, just kind of hanging out, um, playing around with my microscope and the sample to try to see what was in it. And I um, thought I would bring that to some people, see if you guys enjoyed it. Um, particularly like these testate amoebas, I could just watch this all night. This could be the whole stream as far as I'm concerned because they're just like completely mesmerizing to me. Um, also, they're a lot easier than chasing around some of the ciliates that move faster. Um, but, uh, yeah, we did see some worms, and uh, we were uh, trained on a rotifer for quite a while, obviously. So, <laughs> reminds you of the sun. Um, here's a little, that is a little, um, cryptomonad or something. It's got uh, a flagellate I was using to get around. That's another one of the major groups, the flagellates. Sometimes they are autotrophic and sometimes they're heterotrophic, so. Uh, where did I get this sample from? I collected this from Deming Park, which is not far from my house. And yesterday when we were looking at stuff, uh, that was from Hawthorne Park, which is also not very far from my house. And I live in a park-rich neighborhood. Um, I also sometimes will collect samples from Dobbs Park, Fowler Park. Maple Pond Park. There's a lot of parks that are kind of nearby uh, within, you know, maybe a half hour drive. So um, and this one, I just went out to go. I actually was thinking, oh, there's a part of the pond at Deming that has like vegetation. And I'm 
because I'm looking for stentors. I thought, oh, they're more likely to be in these sort of vegetated areas. So I crept into... That's a silly. Um, I crept into the backside of the pond and I actually kind of walked out onto a floating mat a little bit. Uh, and I took some of the vegetation material from shallow water because I was hoping I'd run into a stentor. I'm on a hunt for stentors. I feel like I should be able to find one of these things. Um, they're really cool ciliates. Um, equally mesmerizing to uh, testate amoebas in my opinion. And um, I've never found one. So, you know, it's just like a snark hunt. It's like when I was looking for water bears for like four months or whatever, I finally started finding them all the time because I figured out where they live. Uh, the tiny dancers in the background are probably bacteria, yeah, Henry. Uh, these little things that are moving around. Oh, Rotifer must be nearby. Oh, it's a ciliate. It's trying to crash the party. As you can see, it, they create current. It's got cool movement, doesn't it? It's like legs by committee or something. Um, what is the sample? Yeah, that's that's the sample. So it's just a pond sample. Um, you can see uh, this is how I actually collect it. Um, to put it on the slide, I put a little bit into this uh, transfer pipette. And then you can see it's got some plant material and then a bunch of sediment in there. I was trying to really increase my chances of finding a stentor. Um, is, it, is this considered a pseudopod? Yes, the amoeba have pseudopods. This is a testate amoeba. So it's a sarcodyne, um, is the group. And all of the little uh, appendages that are sticking out are pseudopods. So all these things in here, those are all pseudopods coming out of one organism, the testate amoeba. And the testate amoeba has like a donut shaped uh, underside. We're looking at the top of it um, and the donut shaped underside of it. If you could see it would it'd be a little ring. Sometimes I find just the testate part. Um, When the amoebas are dead or they're resting, uh, you'll just see the little donut basically in the middle here. Um, but these, yeah, those are the pseudopods. It's legs, basically. That's a ciliate that keeps <laughs> flying through our field of view. Um, did I dye it? No. Um, that's the color, it's natural color. Um, it's a little bit, that ciliate really is sticking itself in. Um, it's got a little bit of extra color because of the contrast, so um, I'm going to turn off the high contrast for you. Um, so it's a little bit more transparent. You can actually see the donut a little bit better right now. Like the opening in the middle is this Good news, on the everyone. underside. Um, and then this is the testate part and there's the pseudopods. Um, the reason I have it on super high contrast uh, it's just for um, for the quality of the image. So I think people like the kind of have a little bit more dark background. They can see the bacteria and other things a little bit better. Um, also, uh, that's differential interference contrast, and it's what separates this type of microscope from pretty much anybody else's microscopes that you'll see on Twitch. Um, I mean, they all have great microscopes, but... Um, but this is like a $20,000 microscope and their microscopes are like a $1,000. Um, and they don't have DIC lighting and the DIC is um, basically what we're looking at right now. So you're getting a sort of special view um, of these organisms using a special type of lighting. What it has is a polarizer on the bottom. If I pop it out, you'll see um, there's, sorry about the light, I'll have to fix it, hang on. Um, that's what happens when you take the polarizer out. You lose the ability to adjust the contrast and that disappears. And then it has an analyzer up here at the top that I can also pull out. And then it has a, um, a differential interference contrast 
adjusting lens um, and it has a little knob on here um, that I can turn to brighten the increase the contrast or decrease the contrast when I have the polarizers in so this combination of lenses and analyzers and the objectives that go along with it are what make this microscope so expensive and also what make them so nice oh it's crazy what is it doing right now it did this before when it was like kind of dumping out a bunch of material It's like almost all the way out of the of the testate structure. Um, yeah, that's super weird. Yeah, it's probably um, it's probably regurgitating something it ate earlier. So it's been collecting stuff as it's moved along. It did something like this earlier, and then it just dumped out a whole bunch of debris, and then uh, it started crawling around a lot more. Uh, looking for more food so as it's been walking around and we've been following it I think it's probably been uh, picking stuff up and digesting it um, with its legs you know I think it's just dumping stuff out I think that's a pile of stuff coming out of the hole um, I think it's basically the equivalent of pooping uh, on the stream here and then it'll dump a bunch of debris out um, of the body and then it'll start go looking for more food because they're predators. Um, it's also possible that it could be, uh, I mean, they divide like amoeba. When they get enough food, they divide like mitosis. So it could be splitting. Um, I suppose that's possible. I don't know what happens to, um... <laughs> they only act this way when, when we're watching, maybe. Uh, sorry, it's not centaur, it's stent stentor, stentor, um, stent stentor, it's a type of ciliate, um, not a centaur. Uh, I thought all microscope things were only that see-through transparent color. Oh, most of them are, um. Most of them are transparent. Yeah, I'm totally not sure what this thing's doing anymore, but it stopped moving. I mean, it's still got pseudopods and stuff moving around, but it's, it's not as engaging when it's just sitting there. Hopefully the heat from the microscope lamp isn't causing problems for it. Um, but let's go look around. There's another rotifer, a different type. So this one's not a deloid rotifer. Um, this is a planktonic rotifer that's swimming around and um, looking for food. And I was gonna zoom in on it, but then it decided it was gonna move over here and bump into the ciliate. What? There we go. So just like the other one, this one has a bunch of little cilia around the mouth, the corona, which is on the top end, and it has a little foot with little toes at the bottom. So it's basically similar body plan, but totally different shape. Uh, there was some other type of uh, ciliates in here that I, I saw when I first started looking through this sample. And I have yet to find it again since then, but it was attached. It was a uh, epistylus, I think. Uh, it was attached to something up in here somewhere. Let me see if I can find it by jumping back out a level.
Yeah, Henry, they're trumpet shaped. I don't know what happens when they divide um, Saturn. That is a question I, I've never seen one divide. So um, if that's what it was doing, uh, I've never seen that. I've also never seen them just sort of like dump out a bunch of stuff and and go on with themselves. So, um, oh, there's the rotifer that we saw earlier. And see, we were following other stuff and I just kind of got lost chasing it around, which is, you know, it's okay. Um, this sample is also starting to dry out just a little bit. So it used to have water around the outside edge and all that water is gone. And that does create some problems for these organisms because as it starts to dry, um, it increases the pressure from the cover slip and the pressures can actually get really, really strong. Um, like strong enough to harm these little guys. So I probably need to switch out. Yeah, let's see it's starting to dry out in here. It's moving like a wave through the sample. And I probably need to switch out the sample before uh, everything on here gets crushed. So, Good news, everyone. that's one of our worms. It's eating a diatom right there, actually. Um, but we need to kind of get it out of here before it uh, before it can't move anymore. So, we'll leave the testate amoeba mystery for another day, or maybe for another slide. Oh, there's a worm. There's a flat worm. So one of them's doing okay. I saw one with a diatom trapped in it. It still seems to be doing okay in this part of the slide. Fellow biologist here. Oh, oh welcome in, fellow biologist. Um, and thank you for the follow as well. Uh, I'm not actually a biologist, um, by the way. I'm a paleoecologist, but uh, I play a biologist on YouTube. Oh look, it's got like a really cool twisty, twisty tail. Um, and uh, so when people start asking me a bunch of stuff about the cellular organisms, I usually don't know the answers to those questions. Uh, except for if it's ecologically based questions, and then I do know the answers usually. Ah, hey, it's the little ciliate I wanted to find. Take a look at this one, because it looks cool. I think it's just been sitting here, spinning around. See, it's also creating a current with its cilia. And it looks like they're spinning around in a complete circle, but they actually are just wiggling them in timed waves. That makes the water move like that. And uh, when they do it well, you can see all the particles sort of get adjusted to it. <laughs> it's flat now. Hey, Star Chase, how's it going? Hey, I like a little Roomba. Hey, Mama Bon Bon, welcome in. Howdy, fellow biologists and scientists of all kinds. Yeah, we won't judge you. Non-scientists and scientists alike, welcome in. It is wiggling. Uh, quite fast, actually. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty excited. I don't know why. Maybe it's because we heated up the water a little bit, but um, it could have just decided there was food around it, so it's spinning. <laughs> um, but you can see the little hairs or cilia that fringe around the outside edge of it. And that's what's causing it to <laughs> look, Mom, I'm on TV. Um, this is a sample of, um, it's a pond sample from, whoa, 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 whoa. The flatworm has come to visit. It's like, I'm gonna let you finish, but first I wanna show off how I can dance. Um, <laughs> it just keeps poking back in. Uh, it's just a pond sample from a local pond, uh, lake pond, whatever. It's kind of in the in between 
the two um, from a local park. So, um, I just wanted to see this one little guy. It's going crazy, it's spinning around. Yeah, that worm totally photobombed. Uh, it came flying in. And it looks like there's a... Uh, why is that here, but not there? Um, that thing is super small right there. Like, I can't even see that in my... I'm trying to figure out where that is. Oh, I can see it. It's just barely visible in here. Like a little tiny nematode or something right there. Just almost invisible. A string pulling debris. Yeah, it's a nematode. Uh, that thing is a nematode worm. Um, the little strings that you see down here like this one, that's probably bacteria, but that's a nematode. That's a worm. It's just very, very skinny and very transparent. Um, hey Kirk, how's it going? And this guy appears the ciliate that we're looking at, and it's got little cilia around this, this sort of outside edge here that are fringing. And you can see it's pulling particles towards uh, towards its feeding. It's feeding here. They're, uh, you can see it really kind of pulling in from all directions and spinning itself around using the same mechanism, so... You speak no English, and you don't understand, and you speak French. It's not a telescope, it's a microscope. Yeah. I'm gonna leave this right here while I make another slide. Most of us here speak English, so. But, uh. uh je parle un peu français. I can't speak science in French, though, so don't ask. It's hard enough for me to remember from high school the little French that I took. Yeah, yeah, people just make a mistake. <laughs> what do we need Freckled in here for? Oh, she speaks French. Yeah, you're right. She's good at French. Um, much better than me. My French is not... Uh, my spoken French is not good. Um, I, I don't remember most of my words spoken, but I can kind of keep up with it a little bit um, written. Also, Pacific Plankton could come in, and she speaks French pretty well, too. So... For me, un peu. Just a little. And, uh, like I said, I can read it pretty well. But, uh, people make that mistake about microscope and telescope all the time. In fact, uh, regularly my students will call it a telescope for the first couple of weeks they're in my lab. It's just a normal... People are used to seeing or thinking about the word telescope. Oh, there's another flatworm in here. Let's zoom out a little bit. Someone's helping out. You're nearly fluent in Google Translate. Wow. That's an accomplishment. Um, I got a little bit of water on top of the cover slip. That there is a diatom. Good news, everyone. 
And uh, these are the things I actually study. These guys right here. That's a diatom. It's got a little bit of golden goodness in it. It's crawling around a bit. Uh, that's a type of algae, usually called golden or golden brown algae. There's a lot of flatworms in here. There's another one. Um, and some ciliates. There's a good ciliate right there. And it's sitting still for us, so I can kind of zoom in really nicely. You can see all the little cilia around the outside of their body, from which they get their names. Epitheca and hypotheca in Spanish are the parts of the diatoms. Yeah, it's the same words in English, actually. Uh, epitheca means the top valve, and hypotheca means the bottom valve. So diatoms, their two valves fit together, and one's a little bit smaller than the other. And that's how you separate them. Uh, yeah, there was a worm back there. Um, is the green thing a leaf? A diatom. How big is the ciliate? Um, let's see. Our scale, we're at 10x. We're at about 70 times 5. So, um, we're about 300 times magnification or something like that. I have a stage micrometer right over there. I just never think to put it on here. Um, is the green thing a leaf? There's no leaves in here. Um, we're too uh, close in for leaves. Um, it's a, probably a diatom that we were looking at earlier. So There's a rotifer that's gotten destroyed by something. Um, they're leaf-shaped sometimes, diatoms are. But uh, they crawl around. So that separates them Good from... News, everyone. Distinctly separates them from leaves. And uh, diatoms are my specialization. So if we come across those, I can usually get it into genus and sometimes species for you. So like this guy right here. There you go. I think those are Criticula. And that guy over there is either Calanese or Pinularia. So something bigger moving around in this pile. Uh, and there's a... Um, star anise right there. So there's a bunch of diatoms in these simples. Those are healthy diatoms that have uh, sort of a brownish colored chloroplast. Yeah. Uh, is tardigrade animal microscope? I can put a tardigrade on if you're interested in it. Um, it's not going to be in this sample. Um, or unlikely to be in this sample. That, because uh, this is a pond sample, and I haven't found any aquatic water bears so far. Um, that little thing that you're looking at that's inside the rectangle is pine pollen. That's pine pollen right there. There's a bunch of ciliates hanging out. I haven't found a stentor though. Or a centaur, for that matter. Oh, and I was telling you that I never find copepods, that I haven't seen any of them, but that is the skeleton of a copepod right there. Uh, we see copepods on Pacific Plankton Stream all the time, but they're alive. This one, um, the, the antenna that you can see right there coming off of its carapace, and this one's being eaten by bacteria but that's the foot end down there, and that's the head end right there, and we're a little zoomed in so you can't really see the whole thing at once. 
um, but this is a copepod. It has long antenna here that's actually sort of uh, appendages, not a true antenna. And then it has some uh, legs in here and um, its eye and head are in this part of the body. Diatoms are single-celled algae, yeah. Copepod's a type of um, animal, though. <laughs> These odd streams. Yeah, pragmatic. I'm just, um, this week I'm having fun um, because I don't have a lot of work, and I normally have a lot of work. And I haven't been able to do a bunch of night streams where I just kind of fool around uh, and look at stuff because uh, I've been so busy, and today is actually my busiest day of the week. Um, so I'm at the end of it, and I feel like just having fun. So here we are. But uh, yeah, I should be doing research right now, but it's a little bit late, and I was running out of steam. So that's an ostracod valve right there, ostracod. Type of crustacean, a micro crustacean that lives in ponds. I still haven't seen any living copepods, but I'm kind of surprised to see a copepod skeleton right there. It's probably a molt, but it might be actually a dead one. A lot of diatom. Sorry, I'm just looking around to sort of see what's in here besides the copepod molt and the ostracod shell and the odd worms that come passing through and all these diatoms. So I'm hoping maybe there'll be some more ciliates that we haven't seen yet. That's another diatom right there, by the way. Uh, hang on, I'll make it look pretty for you. This little guy is Gyro Sigma. It's a type of diatom. And it's almost dead. Um, it does have some chloroplast still in it, but it's not doing well. So. When they're healthy, they've got a dark brown or golden colored chloroplast. And it's because they have a special pigment called xanthophyll which uh, is distinct to diatoms, and it gives them sort of an orange or brownish color. Um, if you see them all clumped together or a large mass of diatoms together, that's usually how you can tell it's not um, some other type of thing like green algae or cyanobacteria. Diatoms are... They also have a silicious skeleton, which separates them from those organisms, but um, if you're not looking in a microscope, you can't see that they have silicious skeletons. Like this guy right here. I think it's a nominees. Enjoying yourself while working is the secret of happiness, I agree. Yeah, it's for fun. Genetically modified mosquitoes are to be released in the Florida Keys. Uh, they gotta be careful messing around with um, with mosquitoes because they are the uh, one of the most important parts of the food chain up there. Oh, here comes a worm. It's just rifling through the sediment. It's a little bit bigger than my field of view. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's like I think I got a bead on it and it starts going backward. So these things again are kind of like little ribbons. It's a flatworm. Um, sometimes they get twisted around. We saw one that was kind of twisted earlier. And if it sat still long enough that I could zoom in on it, um, you'd see that it has little cilia-like hairs around its body as well. You can sometimes see them. Let's see if I can 
get there in time. There you go. This is extra layer of difficulty trying to keep that thing in my field of view as it's kind of going forward and backward. That's a diatom right there, by the way. Uh, that we just passed by. That little peanut shaped thing is the skeleton of a diatom. Sure, just start going backwards and then go the other way. Pretty cool. talked and planned now they release unless the public opposes it yeah I think they're trying to do it to control mosquitoes I think you're right um, mrs. J oh it's a uh, we saw one of these last night as well a Kadorid uh, Kaidoris um, this one's not living and it's not my fault it was like this um, but I was talking about Cladocera earlier. This is a type of Cladocera that lives in lake systems. Um, the three main types of Cladocera that you can find are these, Chidorus, and then uh, Bosmina and Daphnia. And they're distinguished by their heads, basically, for the most part. There's some other characteristics, I think, that you can use. But my mouse has decided it didn't want to move anymore. Um, <clears throat> So the, uh, that's their eye. This is their sort of beak, a rostrum. And then uh, they got some appendages down here. These are the swimming appendages. And then there's like a foot at the bottom. Um, but this one's not moving. This one is no more. And it reminds you of a flea. That's actually their nickname is water fleas. That's what they're called. What is the black spot behind the eye? Oh, it's probably a second eye. I think they have two eyes, two sets of eyes. Um, actually, one of their eyes is compound. And um, I think that's the one in the front. And then I think they have a second set. I've seen that black spot on most of them. Um, I think it's a, a, a second eye set. And there's their foot and some of their appendages from the inside of their skeleton. So this sort of brown boundary that's around the outside is actually the carapace for this organism. And it's dead, so we get a nice clean look at its feet um, as a result in its, in its body. Um, if it were living, they usually, you could see their heart beating and other stuff. We saw that last night from a different sample. I don't know what that is. Oh, it's just a piece of junk on the slide. Here's a diet. Good news, everyone! I almost got jumped scared by that uh, Dubrick. Thank you for the follow. Caught me off guard. Uh see what else we can can find in this sample well the bad news is I don't think I found any stentors uh, that's a, actually I think that's a bit of a testy to me but right there that's a testy to me but Skeleton. I thought the test did me, but it looks like a little donut. It's a little paisley shaped uh, ciliate diatom. Uh, a big. There's something we haven't seen yet. Uh, ciliate. I don't recognize this one as one that we've seen before. It's 
it's crawling around like a ciliate, so I'm assuming it's a ciliate. I haven't seen the actual cilia, though. Hey, Rams Reef, how you doing? I, um, I'm working on setting up a command for you. As you can see, all of the, uh, particles that are swirling around towards it. That means it has little cilia. It's spinning. I just can't see them. So it's probably on the other side. Good news, everyone! Yeah, the Daphnia, all the Cladostra are, um, are called water fleas. Just Daphnia are the ones people are most familiar with. Um, and the Daphnia have, like, um, like a more like helmet shaped head um, their eyes are just a little bit more like in the beak and um, uh, their arms are their swimming arms are their bodies are usually a little bit bigger and their swimming arms are a little bit bigger um, and bosmina are usually they have a long trunk so rather than like you know the the um, Hydorus has like a little beak, and um, Daphnia has like a duckbill sort of shaped mouth. The Bosmina have like two long rostra that come down that are like elephant trunks, basically. So I think this is a ciliate um, equimer. How good of a computer do you need to stream this? Um, I mean, you just need to be able to handle a capture card. Um, so it's not a big deal. It's just running OBS, basically, in a capture card, and then a webcam. Um, I have a pretty nice computer, but um, I've streamed it from much lesser computers without any problem. So, Stentors are your jam? That's what I'm looking for. Um, that's what I've been looking for, Pragmatic. I'm trying to find a Stentor. I've never seen one um, on the stream or otherwise, uh, except for, like, Dell's had them. So. happen to be into mind controlling parasites. Ah. Yeah, I have a um a VTube character on um on YouTube called Dr. Mo and I do lectures about all kinds of things including the mind controlling parasites. I did an hour long lecture on those. Um and I didn't get through all of them but um I talked about a bunch of them. But they're really cool. Um, there are people who do telescope streams, um, uh, Saturn, um, Econ Greg is a guy who comes in here regularly who does telescope streams, and, um, uh, I know there's, um, Astro Canuck, so, um, yeah, Astro Canuck, um, This guy um, uh, does streams all the time from uh, with the telescope. He lives in London, even though he's got a Canada name because uh, he's a Canadian uh, um, by nationality. And then um, uh, there's more. There's actually a bunch more that I know of. Um, they they're not on regularly except for um, uh, Econ Greg used to be on all the time when I first started streaming, like last summer. Um, Astro Canuck's on in the afternoons for us um, because he's in London and so his streams are, you know, like when I'm getting out of my afternoon streams, he's usually on. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. Yeah, you should. Thank you for the shout out, uh, Mama Bun Bun. Got the VIP status going. Um, I'm going to set up a, a bot command for. Um, for Rams and when I'm done, when I've finished working through some of these others, I've been sort of just kind of working my way down through people that, rude, it just took off. Um, I'm just adding them a little bit at a time. So it's one of those worms. This one's kind of sitting still. Uh, and I saw something up here crawling around. 
Yeah, so I do, um, we've changed the format for the Spirit University stuff, so now it's just little 10 minute videos. We're trying to be more YouTube-y um, and see how that goes, because I don't know that we're gonna um, reach our goals otherwise. But, um, but I did about uh, five or six lectures that are hour-long lectures on a whole bunch of different topics through Dr. Mo. So you can always go check those out. And I just added one today on um, a, a parthenogenesis. So I was talking about, uh, that's a diatom right there. It's the sort of peanut shaped one that we saw earlier. Um, they're just sort of uh, fun little streams for me to play around with my VTube character. And um, I think maybe I'll eventually port some of it over to uh, Twitch, but for now I've been keeping it completely separate from my Diatoms at Attack um, streams, so it's been my uh, alter ego. I just have, um, I do science lectures to, from that uh, VTuber character. usually like weird organisms in biology. Weird processes or organisms in biology or weird environments. So, yeah. Trippy Jenkins, bye. Okay, bye. Uh, hey, tiny dragon on fire. should go follow a tiny dragon on fire. She does a uh, drawing. Uh, she's making sort of dragon based comic book um, and you can watch her streams on Twitch. Yeah, um, this is a diatom frustule down here. That is um, the skeleton of uh, a Nitsioid diatom, um, but it's not Nitsia. Um, that's Triblianella, which is usually found in soils and stuff like that. And then uh, this guy up here, I think is a star anise that we were looking at before, or maybe it's um, a nominees. Did I say parthenogenesis? I did. I gave a lecture, a short little 10 minute lecture on parthenogenesis. I talked about obligate facultative and cyclic parthenogenesis, the three different major types. And then there's other types of parthenogenesis that, um, that occur uh, that I didn't focus on because they're a little more um, obtuse. They're hard to, to quantify easily for people who aren't familiar with all the other types of parthenogenesis and, you know, like kleptogenesis and, um, so, but, uh, I like talking about parthenogenesis because it was an easy lecture because I usually teach it in my, um, limnology class because the cladocera, especially the daphnia, are cyclic parthenogenic organisms. They are female most of the time and then when there's some environmental um, change that happens they will um, uh, spontaneously produce um, females and males based on the um, environmental conditions and then when those mate they Rather than producing um, uh, amyctic eggs, they produce aphibia, which then are resting spores. And I found us another testate amoeba to follow for a little bit. I don't know, it's trailing a little bit of garbage behind it. Hey, Pacific Plankton, how are you doing? 
You're late to the party. I've been streaming for a while now. Uh, almost two hours. But, uh, you know, I just snuck it in. I like to sneak in a, uh, a stream on Tuesday nights. And I snuck in a stream on Monday night. And I'm gonna streak it. I'm actually gonna sneak in another stream on uh, on Wednesday night. So I'm gonna stream twice tomorrow. Once in the afternoon from the SEM, and once in the evening um, from the light microscope. And I think for tomorrow's stream, I'm gonna look for water bears again. Um, so you know you could skip it probably if you've seen those before. If you just want to hang out, you can. Um, but, uh, I thought I could finish up with my stream and raid Dell from there instead of, um, I thought maybe if I stream on Monday, I could raid you, and then if I stream on Wednesday, I could raid Dell. That way he can play his games on Monday. And then, maybe I won't do Tuesday streams over the summer so frequently, but... I'm sneaky, yeah. Streaky and sneaky. Uh, rotifers do not, they are not parthenogenic. Um, rotifers are strictly sexual reproducers. Um, I like to talk about them when I talk about parthenogenesis because they have an interesting life cycle. Um, that's a good contrast for parthenogenesis, but I left all that out of my lecture because I could get 10 minutes of um, material from just talking about parthenogenesis, so I ended up not using any of your pictures, um, Pacific Plankton. But, um, sorry. Uh, maybe I will use some of them for my lectures, though, for real, real lectures um, as well. Uh, I play games, um, occasionally. Um, most of the time I play Sudoku at night before I go to bed, but um, I've gotten really good at it, so I decided it was kind of boring to me. Um, so I've been playing Sudoku, and I've been doing a little bit of Puzzle Together, um, which is a puzzle game, and um, Pacific Plankton and I, and sometimes other people in my um, chat channel will um, all just work on a puzzle together which is nice uh, and it saves so we can just come back to it and work on it a little bit at a time um, which is a fun you know game to play and then I occasionally play um, actual games when I was doing my PhD I played games all the time I was um, I was designing games for uh, using the World, World of, no, the Warcraft 3 platform, um, which will let you make games. And then uh, after that, I was playing a lot of um, Team Fortress 2. So, and I was actually in competitive leagues playing Team Fortress 2. Um, I was sort of at the end of my PhD and going into my postdocs. And then... Uh, when I had a daughter, I just kind of gave up on most of my gaming, so I still play a little bit now and then, but most of the time, uh, if I'm streaming games on Twitch, it's usually my daughter playing and I'm just kind of hanging out with her. Um, it's, it's good family time, it gives me a little bit of chance to do what I want to do, and then she also wants to stream. Occasionally she gets excited about streaming for a bit, and then we can do that. Oh no, you're making a terrible decision. Don't go towards that thing. What are you doing? Don't go towards the predator. Yeah, go right around it. You bumped into the wrong thing. That's a bad decision. Anyway. Puzzles, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good, um, my, my wife always does puzzles too. Good news, everyone! But she hasn't done any of the puzzle together with us. Um, I think maybe because she doesn't know how to get the software, and I haven't, she hasn't asked, so, 
uh, I just have been doing puzzles without her and then she'll come in periodically and, uh, and check out my puzzle and then be like, I don't know if she's jealous or what, but uh, we're looking at a test date amoeba for people who are coming in late or didn't see the other test date amoeba that we followed around for like, I don't know, 20 minutes. Um, she could figure it out if she really wanted to, yeah. Have I ever thought about teaching a diatom teaching game? You know, they have a diatom teaching game. Um, it's called Sim River. And um, not only does it teach you about diatoms, it teaches you uh, how you can use diatoms to reconstruct water quality. And um, it used to be hosted by some sites in Japan, and I think it's recently moved. I don't know where it's hosted anymore, because I think they stopped hosting it, and some other people took over and started working on it. My friend Karthik, who is in India, um, I think is working with them on the game to update it and upgrade it a little bit. Um, but a lot of times when I'm trying to teach diatoms or um, I want to showcase how we use diatoms in um, in aquatic ecosystems, particularly river ecosystems, um, I'll link people to that or I'll give them an assignment in class that uses it as a way for them to learn. Um, what you can do is you start off with a little stretch of a river and you can tell it what season, you can put cities and farms in and forests and you can tell it how many people live in them and then um, it changes the water quality settings around that and um, and then uh, you run it basically and it produces the diatoms that would live in that quality water and then you have to go in and identify them by matching them against a, a book. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's called Sim River. So it's pretty interesting. And um, I think it's fun. It's geared for high school students, but um, I've, I definitely have used it as an assignment in college before um, because, you know, I give lots of uh, high school level projects to college students and then they're always like, this is too hard. And I'm like, it's designed for people that are, you know, not even in college. Uh, they just like complaining though, so that's normal. They're always complaining about something. Down, down, down. Here we go. That is a ciliate, and I like just these ones. I just call paisleys because they look like little paisleys to me. listening to this song, it's kind of silly. Uh, yeah, this is a ciliate of some type. Now my battery's uh, flashing for real, and uh, I put those other batteries on the battery charger, but they're probably not going to be ready before this one dies. So, i got maybe like 10 minutes left. Um, and I've been streaming for like two hours anyway. It's almost midnight, so... Little Paisley friend is adorable. You're envious of my microscope st uh, setup. Okay, Devil and Mrs. J, thanks for hanging out. Um, it's been fun. We're just chilling on a when Tuesday night, right? Um, this is a, a microscope setup to be envious of, I think. Um, it's expensive, and I can only afford it because my lab purchased most of this stuff. Um, I wouldn't be able to afford a normal microscope like this, but you can get microscopes with DIC that you can buy used, or you could buy something like this kind of used. Um, still going to be expensive, but maybe maybe a little bit closer to affordable. Um, and if somebody took good care of it, it'd probably be okay. There's a diatom. That one's nice and golden colored. It's trapped in some goop. You're always drooling over my microscope. Uh, I really like this microscope. Um, I like my other one as well. Um, I like the option to have 5x and the option to go to dark field if I feel like it. <laughs> 
You prefer looking over someone's shoulder. Well, you've come to the right place. Uh, you know, the nice part is. Um, I don't know that um, I'm an expert in any of these things other than the diatoms, but um, I find some pretty cool stuff in some of these. Here's another little diatom for us. That one is uh, a nominees for sure. It's going backwards until it hits a pile of sediment. Oh, it's just plowing right through it. I thought it was going to bounce and come back. Uh, UTA for thermo, so I can relate to undergrads liking to complain. Yeah. Uh, big problem with microplastic in the freshwater realm. We saw some microplastics earlier, Henry. Um, I saw a couple of little red strands in here. And, um, and they aren't mine. Uh, we could see the cilia that time. We were in super close on this guy. Um, because I collected the sample in the jar that it's in and there's no plastic in here except for now there's plastic in my transfer pipette but none of it's red uh, but we saw some red plastic fibers in the freshwater systems and um, I will tell you that uh, we looked at gut contents of fish that are in the Wabash River which is the closest river to where I live and um, we pulled microplastics out of the fish guts going back um, from ancient collections going back to the 1960s, um, which is the earliest samples that we had from the Wabash River. They had uh, plastic fibers and plastic beads and other things that the fish had consumed from river systems. Um, so we have like a 70 year history of microplastics in the environment in freshwater systems. Um, and then people also have uh, done the same thing from lake sediments where they were able to find microplastics in lake sediments. Um, where they um, date the cores and then go back in time and look at um, look at what uh, when microplastics arrived in their environments. So we have a paper that's like ninety percent, ninety five percent written um, that a student put together on a project where they looked at microplastics in those fish guts and. Um, I don't know why it hasn't been pushed forward to the point where we submitted it. So that's in the to-do list for hopefully this summer to get that submitted. I think maybe COVID just kind of slowed everything down everywhere, including that project. So I asked one of my co-authors about it the other day and they said, oh, I don't know like what happened after the COVID situation to kind of just kind of shut everything down. Um, there's another diatom. See a lot of the detail. <laughs> it's very ominous, yeah. Battery death is imminent, yeah. Uh, PCBs. I don't know if I have a good way of looking at looking at or looking for PCBs. I'm sure they're in the environment here, though. I'm sure that that's a true case. <laughs> um, it's just playing stuff at random, uh, Tiny Dragon. So uh, maybe my ominous uh, battery flashing. It's, uh, it's adding a lot of tension to the story, so. Uh, edible plastics are a possible solution, yeah, or plastics that just decay, or if you were in Pacific Plankton stream the other night, um, she went on a long rant about it, a good one, a good rant um, about what we should do. And I actually agree with her. The, the fault is actually in the microscope, or not microscope, the plastic, um, companies that make plastic um, when they could use something else like plastic bottles that are single use we could be using glass for that or or something else so um, we have uh, as, uh, my battery is flashing and we're reaching some sort of a um, an end for tonight I think you didn't mean to be that ranty but the guy you started on plastics which is like you know one of your topics, right? Um, so, uh, 
I think now would probably be a good time to stop what we're doing. And uh, yeah, you were correct. Um, and we can go raid uh, either Mr. Horologist or Freckled Science or Blake Balance is doing something really trippy or we can go get Ram's Reef. Um, or if somebody has another suggestion, we can do that. But I think we should probably raid somebody now. Um, if anybody has a preference, you can just spit it out and we'll make our decision. I'll let you make the decision, um, whoever it is. And if you don't, then I'll probably just pick one of those people. So you don't suggest anymore. Uh, you've been burned too many times by suggesting we go raid empty channels. <laughs> Elon's Mars can. Uh, I don't really like raiding it when it's just like a camera. Um, those are, they're not very responsive to the raid. It sort of defeats the purpose. So. Just pick? Okay. Mr. Horologist? Okay. Frizzik, we'll get Mr. Horologist. He raided us yesterday and he's getting close to ending his stream right about now anyway. I'm guessing. So, we'll just go get him. Oh no, he's still working on something. So we'll raid him back. We'll get Ram's Reef next time. Uh, cause Mr. Haral just raided, raided us. And, um, and we'll go get him. That'll be good. And then, uh, I'll be back tomorrow with some water bears, probably. If you're interested in that kind of thing. And, um... Who knows, maybe I'll just stream every day this week. You never know. I've got time off for uh, good behavior this semester. Um, we had a bunch of follows. Um, I should try to pick them out. Ed Palace, Old Man Gamer, Dubrick, Weeb, Kirk Kulu, um, Air Ace, uh, Imanoli, ABR San, Rise Skill, Cow1000, Elkai's8, uh, Gumpy2, we had cheers from Smooch, and cheers from Cyanide Teacups, and a resubscription from Cyanide Teacups for seven months. Um, Leptoteron, uh, Crypto Kid, Chiroptid, I mean, uh, Caplink. Uh, anyway, a whole bunch of followers. Uh, so thank you all for those follows. And it's been a fun stream, and I will catch you tomorrow. So um, if you have your Diatom raid, uh, emotes, now's the time to get ready to spam them. Otherwise, uh, just whatever rage you're interested in. So, um, we'll catch you next time. Thanks. <laughs>